Hello, this is K.L. Kandek, the Vice President of Marketing at Mokana, and thank you for joining our webinar today on IoT security best practices migrating away from open source security, and I would add migrating away from it safely. Today we're joined by two speakers, our Vice President of Engineering at Mokana, Srinivas Kumar, and also Dean Weber, our CTO at Mokana. And uh, the three of us would all like to wish you a happy Pi Day on <laughs> March 14th. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, uh, a little bit of background on this webinar. This is part of a three-part series on migrating away from open source. Today, we're mostly going to be covering the risks associated with open source security. Uh, and the second in the series will focus on compliance and support costs, looking at the true cost of open source. And the third will look at, in more detail, how to migrate safely off of open source security. You may be using a variety of different security uh, software that you can download off, uh, off, of the, off of the internet. We're going to show you how you can migrate safely away from that if that's part of some of your initiatives. Okay. Jumping into that, uh, a couple of things. If you have a question, please submit it over chat. That is the, the best way to do that. And this presentation, as well as a white paper, will be available for you after the presentation. You'll be able to also view this webinar uh, on Bright Talk afterwards. So, uh, uh, yeah. So Srinivas, our head of engineering, has, uh, uh, was previously at several security companies, also was an EIR at uh, SRI, and uh, was VP of engineering at Solutions for, an, for Identity-Based Access Controls company Applied Identity, which was acquired by Citrix. And he's also been a, uh, a contributor at Nortel, Lucent, and TransSwitch. He holds several patents in the field of cybersecurity and has worked both in the commercial and, uh, and uh, defense side. Dean Weber, our CTO, uh, was formerly the CTO of CSC Global Cybersecurity. He was also at Applied Identity as the CTO, uh, and that was acquired by Citrix. And Dean is a, uh, a frequent speaker across the board at several at events, um, as well as in both public and private sector and previously he was working in uh, physical and electronic security in the U.S. Navy. Uh, that was quite a while ago. <laughs> All right, well, welcome, guys. Let's get started and uh, have some fun with this. So let's face it, open source. Who doesn't use open source, right? We all love open source, frankly. On our, on our uh, computers, we use it. On servers, it's used everywhere. Um, I guess the challenge is... Uh, um, uh, what about using open source for uh, production? So according to one report, more than half of the companies, 55%, are leveraging open source software for production infrastructure, not just within a company, not just on your personal computers or systems that are primarily uh, uh, internal facing, but also for production. And that has jumped up 65% from the prior year. That's quite a bit. Um, why are companies doing it? Well, improving the quality of their solutions. It's ready software. Sometimes it's, it's easy to simply download it and su support what you need to get done. Um, and, uh, and oftentimes, from a security perspective, it ends up being a, a choice to simply check the box. I need to have this particular feature Someone has asked for it. I'm a developer. I'm going to do that, um, and it's easy. Uh, in other cases, having access to source code, uh, in the case of embedded systems and IoT software development, is also a driver, being able to download source code, customize it, and compile it into your application. Oh, and it's free. It's it, Well, it is free, right? Uh, so... Dean, tell us about 
this notion of, of risk and free open source security software and uh, uh, some of the, the, the pros and cons and what you've seen out there with open source and risk? Sure. So, I, I mean, it, at the end of the day, we're not saying that open source is bad. We're saying that open source security, you might want to consider alternatives. Um, the security components are the, are the pieces that may be difficult to actually achieve some validation goal, uh, whether it's compliance or whether it's just a, an objective security metric um, that you're trying to accomplish. When you're using open source, uh, obviously the open source vulnerabilities are, are resident, right? There's a lot of um, code out there that is to be vulnerable or can be vulnerable, um, you know, as we as we saw with Heartbleeds, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, you know, a big code base function um, was was dangerous. <laughs> it was it was downright dangerous because not only was the vulnerability exposed in a lot of platforms, but the inability to even record whether or not it was exploited was a was a major problem. So. When you talk about free, you, you, you talk about you, the, the source code is free, but the implementation is not free. Um, your ability as a developer or as an integrator or as a operator to maintain the platform, I mean, we're, we're, we're looking right now at what's going on with the open source, open SSL community specifically. Um, there's a lot of confusion going on out there right now with where they are with 1.1.0 and 1.1.1 and whether or not they're going to be able to achieve FIPS in the in the reasonable future before their last certificate expires, which is the end of 2019. Um, you know, these are these are all things to be brought into consideration um, when you're looking at how to implement the code. Yeah, well, let's let's look at at one of the the big risks out there. And while we're going through this, we'd love to get a feel for uh, uh, who is out there on the line. So we're going to ask a question via poll now on what part of the business you're associated with. The OT, operational technology side of running production environments, or IT, um, uh, or, or some other area. So, But Dean, let's talk about one of the, the, the big... Uh, vulnerabilities that are, that are out there, right? We see, we saw struts in Apache recently, but Heartbleed was one of the big ones. Talk about what that was and what happened. Well, so I mean, it, it, the Heartbleed bug was was a was a vulnerability in the code itself that had been um, missed by many people that had reviewed the code. I mean, the part of the the advantage or the supposed advantage of open source is lots of eyes on the code, lots of people implementing the code, lots of people looking for bugs in the code. The problem, of course, is, is that nobody looks at the code base in its entirety because nobody implements the code base in its entirety. So the hard place bug kind of um, fell between the cracks, if you will, of people that should have potentially seen this vulnerability and didn't because they didn't use that part of the code set. It was there, but it wasn't something that they were using on a regular basis. So at the end of the day, it's, it's, a, it's a function that was uh, overlooked by the general community. And once implemented, um, it was difficult to determine whether or not the exploit had actually ever been used because there was no reporting associated with that code set. So all the way around, it was a, it was a it was a hole <laughs> in the software, basically, that allowed people to do bad things with the code base, gain access to other elements of the code base, gain access to other elements of the system through that exploitation. And, and just finding it in the embedded architectures was very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, I, I was at CSC when that happened, and I can tell you that we spent lots and lots and lots of time and effort trying to ferret out where all the code existed. On embedded systems, on so embedded some systems. would think that Heartbleed just impacted uh, web TLS on web servers and things like that. No, it impacted far more than that. Um, you know, I mean, we, we found evidence of, of some of the binaries and things like uh, IBM tools on the mainframes. We found it in, in switches and routers and firewalls and places where people didn't even know 
that they had open source. And as a result of that, we've seen some of the big software scanners like Fortify and Veracode, Checkmark, all doing checks for um, the use of open source code in a code set that may not have been even been known to the coder that it was there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The vulnerability existed and they didn't know that it existed because they didn't even know they were using open source binaries. So, it, 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 again, it's a, it's a problem in the fact that open source is so ubiquitous. Yeah. You know, it comes with every Linux distribution, basically. Um, and again, we're talking specifically about OpenSSL. This is, this is where we run into problems because nobody fully understands everything that's in the code base. It's a half a million lines of code. And... You know what do you what do you do after it's compiled, right? Somebody compiles right. it in, and it, and it's just there. It just works. Right. Yep. So let's dive into that whole notion of uh, of is open source security software safe enough for IoT in particular for our audience here? Uh, and, and I would actually add, uh, is it uh, reliable enough, uh, safe enough for mission critical IoT, especially? Right, and what should we think about? So that's yeah. a that's a <laughs> that's an interpretive question. Obviously, mm -hmm. um, I would say that you need to make those kind of risk analyses yourselves. Um, you know, I, I we we've challenged some customers to say that they're using open source effectively, that they're able to patch effectively, that they're able to update effectively, that they actually know the implementation of the code that they're using. And, and all of the potential ramifications of that. You know, open source isn't free. At the end of the day, it's, it's, there's a cost associated with trying to maintain that without the commerciality that is behind non-open source code, right? Whether you're paying a vendor to do that for you. <clears throat> so the, the, the good news about open source is, is that it is available for free the bad news about open source is that it is not free to implement and maintain. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's for various reasons, mostly around security of the code base itself and the ability to patch the code base, the ability to update the code base, the ability to rely on the code base uh, to do the functions at the level specified. You know, if you're looking at, at FISMA or if you're looking at 853R4, soon to be R5, if you're looking at uh, 62443, all of these have a basis in a, in a general function around the survivability of the code and the susceptibility of the code to things like side channel attacks. Right. And, you know, when you, when you implement a code base, you, you expect those things to be there, and they may even be there at the particular time of implementation. But then in the industrial space, they're out there for a very long time. Right. And they, they can... If you're not staying up on them, you're, you're, you're exposing yourself to all kinds of potential nastiness. So we're going to explore another question here and dive into each of these areas. But before I do that, I'm going to ask another question of the audience about, uh, do you use open source security software in your production environment today? Uh, get a feel for this. So Dean, talk about you know these risks. Let's get more specific about where some of those risks lie. Um, well, again, I, the, the code base is so complex, having anybody that is truly an expert in the entire code set would be difficult to acquire. So generally what you've got is a community and the concept of community being able to uh, individually exercise components of the code and provide feedback to the open source community for potential fixes, et cetera. Um, the reality is, is that People use the code for usually a very specific set of, of requirements, and they leave the rest on the table, if you will, right? So they, they don't know, they don't use, they don't have any reason to explore other elements of the code structure, right? If they're just using it for SSL transport and certificate interface or for self-signed certificates, these are things that you can do, you know, relatively easily, um, but without a real knowledge level of security. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the FIPS libraries associated with OpenSSL, you know, those have constricted pretty, pretty drastically here in the last few years, and, and, open, and the OpenSSL Foundation has struggled with 
trying to keep up with all of the FIPS validations for all of the permutations, particularly in the private labeling sector. Mm -hmm. So the, the vulnerability uh, databases are just bulging with, with code uh, exploitation, mm -hmm. um, potential vulnerabilities in code execution, potential vulnerabilities in, in buffer overflow and in in-memory attack architectures. It, this is this is not going to going to decrease. This is going to continue to increase as more and more people become code aware of what the vulnerabilities can be. And then you know the toolkits are just out there. The, the can openers are out there to just use these exploitations. Sure. Willy sure. Really. So, Srinivas, uh, uh, talk to us about. Um, uh, I mean, you manage a whole team of of crypt. Crypto, cryptography, uh, PhDs, and developers. Talk to us about some of your concerns around uh, some of the open source libraries and, and the code bases in particular. First challenge for developers is the volume of open source code. If you just take open SSL as an example, uh, it compiles to two megabytes. Uh, so it's a pretty uh, huge database of uh, code. Uh, it's a, there's a code churn. On a monthly basis, uh, vulnerabilities are published faster than the good guys can go after them and fix those problems. Uh, and because it's a it's a community, uh, I would say ad hoc code reviews. The obligation of testing goes to the end users. The quality assurance has to happen in your release cycle. So there is a overhead of, uh, like Dean mentioned, it's not free. It's part of your agile Scrum cycle you will be liable for any defects in that code. And when you start looking at the code from any software engineering standpoint in terms of uh, process, this is what we used to call spaghetti code, right? It's uh, Nobody owns it, it's a rental car. And so what you see is bad practices of coding. Uh, any software engineering professor will tell you data abstraction is key to security. When applications start accessing data structures within the code, you're exposing the vulnerabilities, and that's how in-memory attacks happen, where they trample over your structures, they steal your keys. So this bad practice is there in a lot of OpenSSL enabled applications, whether it's curl, wgad, you name it. Mm -hmm. So what uh, we advocate is a strong data abstraction concept, that you don't get access to private structures and you need to work through APIs. And that's the best way you can protect the type of attacks that happen, uh, whether it's a heart bleed or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then the, uh, the next aspect is coding guidelines. Because it's a community effort, there is no coding guidelines. There's a different programming style. Each one has their own style. And all this just doesn't play well when it comes to an auditor, whether it's a common criteria or whatever, because you're embedding source code from third parties, it is not following your software development process. And the worst part of open source is the fragmented nature where people could take snippets of code from open source and embed it into their product. And nobody would even know that that fragment of code was what we used to call in the old days cut and paste. That is not traceable. That is not auditable. It's very difficult for an auditor to know, do you use third party? What percentage of your code uses third party? What percentage of that is vulnerable when there is a CVE, right? If you use OpenSSL as a package and you don't modify it, then that CVE applies to you. But if you take a few lines of code out of that and use it, how would anyone know that those few lines of code is vulnerable to that CVE? It is not auditable, not traceable, and that's a big challenge for a program manager, for an auditor, you name it. Mm -hmm. So it's covert, and that's really the biggest risk. Bad programming practices, and the vulnerabilities that are hidden. That's really the challenge. So we have a, related to this slide, we have a question from the audience. Uh, do you see open source suppliers moving towards designing against a security framework like NIST CSF? Is there enough detail there for developers to provide formidable security? Um, I, I can take a shot at that. Yeah. So <laughs> the, the short answer is, Yes, they are doing some. The question is strength of claim, right? So if we're actually talking about trying to meet one of the NIST requirements, 
you, you have to generate an artifact that, that represents that your compliance with that particular element. Um, some they do fairly well. Some they are pretty ambiguous about. Some they don't even bother with. And this is again where the subjective nature of the of the risk framework um, itself takes into consideration whether or not you should be using things that you know have vulnerabilities that can't be or haven't been patched. Uh, I mean, if you look at the vulnerability database on on OpenSSL, there's there's vulnerabilities dating back years that have never been addressed that have continued forward in existing code bases, and it's because they're fundamentally broken inside the code set. And you can't fix them easily. You can, you know, attempt to reduce access levels to the exploit, but that's an external function. That's not a code function. So the, the short answer to your question is: uh, Is there enough detail for developers to provide formidable security? Define formidable. Uh, you know, if you're talking about FISMA high or you're talking about 62443 3-3 level four, the answer is probably not. And we've seen that coming from customers our customers who are coming back to us and saying, you know, help us replace the open source, open security source specifically, OpenSSL and others, so that we don't have these kinds of vulnerability uh, long tails, we don't have these vulnerabilities in, in, in the code sets that we don't even use. Uh, show us how to, to get rid of that stuff so that we don't have any downstream liabilities to things like GDPR. Mm -hmm. And I would add, uh, if you are concerned about this area of standards, compliance, recommendations, best practices, join our webinar on April 4th where we will review the recently uh, released uh, white paper from the Industrial Internet Consortium entitled Endpoint Security Best Practices, where it goes beyond just development, but really what you need to do to ensure Safety and reliability and security on endpoint devices. A really, a really great paper. Um, uh, okay, so another area is just simply vulnerabilities. So MITRE manages the CVE database. W what are we seeing there in terms of vulnerabilities, Dean? It, it, it's a hockey stick, right? So <laughs> as more code is used, uh, you know, this is the old uh, Apple versus Microsoft question, right? Uh, was Apple truly better code or were they just less prevalent? And I think the definitive answer of that was yes, they were less prevalent. Now that they are more prevalent, they've had to do much more to uh, validate the security of their code base as they have gotten more popular. I think as more and more people look at encrypted communications, as more and more people look at certificate-based communications, you know, OpenSSL has been a, an answer to that to check the box, as you talked about earlier, where now checking the box without really understanding what it is that you're making the claim for is, is becoming a little more difficult. Now they're, they're really wanting you to generate an artifact that says, yes, I understand that Self-signed certificates are not the not the hot ticket. Right, right. So anyway, the, the vulnerabilities are going to continue to increase as the code base utilization increases, and and that's not going to stop. Right. I mean, it, it, as long as people are using the code, it's going to continue to advance because more people are going to be looking at this as a potential way into the vulnerability. I mean, what what better way into a system than through the security software itself? Right. So a couple answers on these polls. 18% uh, of the audience is from the OT environment, um, uh, and 31% is from the IT, uh, and 50% other. Um, uh, in terms of how do you use, do you use open source production in your or open source security in your production environment today? Uh, we talked, we saw that that was 55%. Uh, from one report for open source in general, 55%, uh, but it looks like uh, there are 38% that are using open source security software yeah, today, which is I, I don't find surprising at all. I, I think it's, it's uh, of the ones that have been deployed, it's high. And to Srinivas' earlier comment, how do you know? And how do you know? Right. <laughs> That's the problem. So... Um, yeah, I would love to take a measure of, you know, how concerned the audience is about vulnerabilities, whether it's a big concern, a small concern, 
uh, whether we're, people are just learning about options here. So I've launched that poll. Um, so within that CV database that MITRE maintains, um, OpenSSL is responsible for a, a, a high number of vulnerabilities. Talk about what that means in terms of um, the frequency, patching, impact kind of support uh, here. Well, I mean, if you do the math, as the slide points out, you know, that's three vulnerabilities a month. In, in the industrial space, that's, that's a difficult number to deal with when your maintenance windows are small or non-existent. You're trying to make a determination whether or not this is something that would be a risk to the operational environment, whether this could impact production. Um, it, you know, the OT world is a little different than the IT world in the fact that the criticality of the devices and the risk associated with the devices isn't about loss of reputation or potentially loss of finance or financial or, or uh, you know, even fine-based elements. It's more about loss of life. Uh, you know, I mean, in the big industrial players, you know, they measure risk in bodies, right? Events are actually measured in how many bodies would be impacted mm -hmm. in an event. Not just or, data privacy. Not just data privacy, yeah. exactly right. So, it, it, it's a sliding scale when you get into the operational technology world that these vulnerabilities need to be patched and there's no opportunity to do so. Well, it's a conundrum, right? You have these these IoT and industrial systems, especially the mission critical IoT uh, environments where they're tougher to secure and in fact the level of risk to human safety, personnel safety in the environment is higher. It's it's kind of upside down, right? Um, uh, so um, a quick quick yeah, go ahead. That, um, if you compare with the OT and IT world in embedded systems, uh, it is more critical to handle exceptions because if there's an attack, that device becomes a brick. Mm -hmm. The reason that OpenSSL and all these open source have kind of got good mileage in the server side is if you look at the uh, the pedigree of uh, engineers, they do better exception handling through C++, Java, and they can handle those type of exceptions. You cannot have your server come down, right? So there's a lot more protection. But in the embedded world, we are talking hardcore C programmers, right, who are the fearless uh, embedded C programmers. And C as a language does not give you protection. And so it's very important that uh, good software engineering practices are put in place. Right. So we've uh, gotten some feedback from the poll. How concerned are you about open source security? 58% concerned, 41% mildly concerned, uh, no one is not concerned. And uh, uh, interesting, no, no one clicked on very concerned. So I, I think that explains kind of uh, the mindset here. Okay, another area that we talked about, you know, in addition to the code base challenges, the complexity of the code, maintaining it, the vulnerabilities that are out there that we know of that haven't been patched is just this remediation process. There's a vulnerability. You got to find a patch for it. You got to develop a patch for it. Then it's got to get out into the market. Um, uh, talk about. Let's talk about uh, what what that actually uh, uh, what that actually means and um, and what we're seeing in some of these uh, platforms and how long it takes. So, I, I, I mean, the graph you're looking at pretty much tells the story, right? I mean, the OpenSSL Foundation actually, you know, does a pretty good job of telling on itself how how bad it is. Um, whether or not people understand what they're looking at is a different story. But the, the, the fact is that remediation in general for the, the web community is a pretty well understood function nowadays. When we talk about patching in the industrial communities, that's not quite so easy, right? Again, you've got minimal maintenance windows. I mean, just testing the, the update itself can be a months-long project. And I don't think that even as bad as this crap is, I don't think it actually takes into consideration the industrial markets where, you know, it, it can take upwards of a year to validate a, a single modification. Mm -hmm. You know, some of some of these these lead times 
I mean, I've actually seen industrial environments that only have a maintenance window once a year. Sure. So, well, yeah. <laughs> and, and what you're seeing here is for these reported CVEs, how long it took to respond. And I think, you know, rolling up those numbers is kind of interesting and it presents a, ch a challenge here. Yeah, but that's respond from the code perspective. That's not to implement the code right, change. Right, right. Because right? OpenSSL can't measure that. Right. And it's going to differ by industry, it's going to differ by uh, platform base, uh, criticality, uh, resiliency. You know, this is why the concept of digital twins has been mm -hmm. being promulgated a lot. Where you know we can test these uh, these types of events in a in a digital twin environment to see if there's any unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. it still, all takes time. Sure. Right. So the the physical fact that we're having these kinds and this volume of vulnerabilities is, is what is really right. the part of the issue. So, on average, it takes about 40 days from when a vulnerability is reported uh, to there being a a patch. Um, now, how long then does it take to implement the patch? How does that all work? Well, so again, so somebody's going to have to take the, the open source community's input or, or even participate in that input. They're going to have to take that result. They're going to have to install it in, in a test environment. They're going to have to evaluate it in the test environment. They're going to have to try and mirror their production environment in that test environment. And then they're going to have to figure out how to get the update onto yep. the platform. Because you know, in some of these environments, we have lim limited connectivity as well. You know, they, they may be sending bodies with laptops out into the field sure. to do these kinds of updates. So again, ba balancing the criticality of the of the event versus the remediation, and then the entire remediation process can take weeks, months, right, years, right. So we've got a question here. Do you think OpenSSL is responsible for the same percentage of unreported vulnerabilities? Or do they just have better reporting? It's kind of an interesting question. Uh, I can give my my opinion on that. I, I think that um, the open source community has actually gotten pretty good at self-reporting. Um, so do they do they have the same numbers of of code vulnerabilities? I I don't know how to answer that. I mean, it, you, you're you're against an infinity number. Mm -hmm. We don't know what we don't know. Right. So if it's an unreported vulnerability and somebody's exploiting it, also known as a zero day, yeah, you know that could go on for a, a short period of time, or in the case of like Stuxnet, it could go on for a very very long period of time mm -hmm. without the actual knowledge being disseminated that a that a vulnerability existed. Right. Somebody's exploiting it, but nobody right. nobody on the defender side has been able to to gain that knowledge right. yet. So in the in the big picture of things, I would say the open source community is pretty good on reporting itself. Is that greater or lesser than the commercial code base? I think the numbers would tell you that the commercial code base reports less vulnerabilities. Does that in reality make for a, a, a disparity between the two or is it just an unreported issue? Yeah, that, I mean, that, I, that's I can see a, a number of, you know, dependent variables here. One is just, as we talked about earlier, the size of the code. Would that relate to more vulnerabilities? There's statistics on that. Um, it could be what, you know, they're suggesting, which is OpenSSL Foundation has a better reporting uh, methodology than others. I would look at that and say that may be correlated to the number of people and the systems they have, and it's unclear to me that, one one organization has a leg up on the other. It's very much related to, to, to funding, which is also, you know, uh, questionable. So I think it's interesting. I'm not sure if we have a, a hard answer for you, though. Well, and I don't know that we could ever have a hard answer. I mean, look at Microsoft and Patch Tuesdays, right? I mean, we're getting <laughs> away from that nowadays. But so there's yeah. at least right. 52 events per yeah. year where Microsoft has an opportunity to update their entire code base, not right. just their security software, but all of their functions. Right. Yeah. Of course, security is at the top end of that, and they have an exception routine where they can go out and do that. Is that reported against OpenSSL? No, it's not. Right. Yeah, we thought Patch Tuesdays was frequent, but now, now they call it a value-add update. Yes. Okay. So um, I guess, you know, the challenge is it takes maybe up to 
half a year here, but it's um, uh, uh, a 90% uh, uh, of the vulnerabilities are going to be exploited in 40 to 60 days. So if it's half a year and they're getting in in 60 days, that's that's part of our challenge here. How do you reduce that time to to uh, uh, to fixing it? Short answer is write better code. <laughs> Yeah, and to that, right. uh, the next question there, uh, is it uh, OpenSSL that's the source of the problem, uh, or they just better at uh, confessions? Uh, hmm. Basically, uh, it, it really is a combination of both. Uh, the way, uh, obviously, the vulnerabilities exist because of the way the code is written, so it's uh, in one way a source of the problem. Uh, the transparency with which it is reported is good, and we definitely credit uh, the community for that. But at the end of the day, uh, uh, we have to fix the problem at the source. And as the volume of lines of code increases, the, the metric is very simple that the bugs will are really proportional to the number of lines of code. And so that code blo bloat in OpenSSL is going to become a bigger problem as time goes by. Yep. Okay, we're uh, uh, running up against the clock here. So um, what can we do? What's our, our vision and what can be done? Um, I'd like to talk about at least some ways we're actually helping OEMs and device manufacturers to migrate away safely from uh, uh, open source uh, SSL libraries. Um, Dean, can you give a quick flyby on kind of just how Mokana works, what what we do with these types of devices and pro, uh, out there. Well, I mean, the short answer is, so we're commercial crypto, right? I mean, at the core, we, we are a open source, open SSL replacement, if you will. Uh, but we provide a lot more value than that, right? The idea is, is that you don't just want to be a crypto engine. You want to be tied to a root of trust. You want to be doing trust measurements. You want to be able to be doing trusted updates. You want to be able to do effective enrollment and management functions. You want to be able to convey that in terms of a, uh, a, a value between devices so that you can create bi-directional trust. Uh, these are all things that, that can be done with, with the Mokana source today. And, and again, we do distribute as source. So it, it's, it's not that you can't see how the code works, right? When you engage with Mokana, you're actually buying access to source code. Right, yep. So device connecting up to a cloud that uh, has a device stack on it from a TCP IP stack to the network drivers. What kind of software fits in here as, as you might look at others, except it, it does quite a bit. And uh, um, talk about how customers actually use it and in particular how they would use it in conjunction with, with this. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, basically our customers start with the source code distribution that we provide. Uh, we also have an option for a binary distribution if you choose. And then uh, we provide the, the required project files or make files for the uh, ID of choice depending on what that platform is. Uh, as an example, it could be a Wind River ID, a Workbench or a Microsoft Visual Studio or a Renaissance eStudio, which makes it easy for the the project to be imported in uh, into your uh, solution and then it's uh, compiled and uh, uh, either uh, flashed onto uh, uh, put in flash memory or over a jtag pushed to the board or over the network socket uh, we, we support uh, uh, c apis we provide support for java uh, with the jni uh, so yeah, you can write either C apps or Java apps, or for that matter, even Python apps, where uh, we provide you the make files to redirect uh, Python to our runtime. Mm -hmm. and, and kind of looking at at just the breadth of what we provide, um, so this goes beyond an SSL library. Right. So what we provide from a transport stack perspective uh, as a replacement to the open source uh, equivalents is the ability to perform the security functions anywhere in software, in secure enclaves, or in secure elements below. 
So one one of the biggest exposures in open source, uh, for example, open SSL, is most hackers know how the code works and where the code is and how it's written. But by virtualizing that function of sorts by putting it into a secure element, uh, that is protected. You can't see the code that generates the keys or uses the keys inside the secure element. And we facilitate that through our trust abstraction platform. All our transport stack uses the abstraction platform that hooks into a secure element of your choice, mm -hmm. whether it's a TPM, an MPU, MCU, and we can give, provide you the list of all the silicon vendors. So that basically is really taking security to the next level where you want to move your secure functions or what is called trusted functions into the enclaves, whether it is an ARM trust zone or Intel SGX or secure element. Right. So it's beyond acceleration. Now, OpenSSL can provide you hardware acceleration. Acceleration is not protection. So the software, while it's not open source, it's source code, totally transparent. You get the source code, and that compiles into applications that get put on, on devices, right? And um, uh, where uh, uh, if a customer wants to replace Open SSL, for example. Can you talk a little bit about this notion of the connector, the shim, uh, to our code? Yes. Yeah, so we provide a connector, which uh, more technically is a shim, that allows you to migrate from the Open SSL code base to our nano stack. And this can be done without modifying existing Open SSL applications that would still link into the libraries of Open SSL except that we provide the shimming through uh, that layer. So essentially, the code that is run on the SSL side, as well as the crypto side, is the Mokana Nano code. And uh, what we have provided is a simple shim, which makes it easier for applications to not uh, have to be rewritten. Mm -hmm. uh, the connector itself is done under the GPL uh, license uh, requirements. And then you can license the Mukana modules as a plugin, which can be dynamically plugged in. Right. So, you know, for certain mission critical, if you have your application running on your device and you need to be FIPS compliant or just need to reduce some perceived risk, you could replace that library with Mukana's FIPS validated library and use this connector and not have to rewrite your application. Right. right. And we also extend the hardware acceleration harness to beyond just acceleration. You can now put in a secure element that can also provide you secure key storage. It can provide you certificates. It can provide you identity. It can provide you right. measurements. So it is beyond acceleration. So we're going to go into this in a couple of webinars in more detail. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to, in, you know, at least let the audience know that, that this is, that's a, a big piece of what what we are doing with our large customers uh you know one example is how we've built this all the way into the wind river vx works uh, ide workbench so it can be completely integrated into uh, larger scale dev environments and product teams and um uh and i think one of the other pieces here that's important is we're not just talking about ssl we're talking about crypto that can do device integrity, make ensure the device is trustworthy, use trust chaining authentication, and again, we'll we'll go into more of that um, in another uh, webinar. But there are significant advantages to doing that. Um, with that, you know, I want to thank you all for for joining. Um, oh, we have this one question here on J2EE and SAML. Okay, uh, the we provide several authentication modules uh, based on the EAP uh, RFC. Mm -hmm. And so as part of that, uh, all the EAP methods are supported. Uh, we have several uh, upcoming uh, services that will support uh, OAuth 2 and uh, tokenized uh, authentication. Uh, so this is not something that comes as part of the secure transport protocol, but we do have other uh, nano products that provide these type of authentication mechanisms. Excellent. Um, well, it, uh, I want to, we're kind of running right up against the time here. I want to thank everyone for joining. 
If you have questions, want to follow up, please go to our website. Uh, all of these materials will be shared with you as well as a white paper. And uh, please do join us in our future webinars um, on uh, the, the other two in the series and also on endpoint security best practices. Uh, Mokana provides embedded security software to some of the largest OEMs in the world and we're on about 100 million devices and uh, we would love to, to work with you and explore how we can help you. So thanks again for joining and have a great rest of your week.